Let's do it. Well, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, I'm delighted to welcome a author to the Storybox podcast. His name is Matteo Ascarapor, if I said that correctly. Um, he works to aim to empower people of color to seize opportunities for advancement, no matter the obstacle in front of them. He was a 2018 Rhode Island Writers Colony writer in residence, and his writing has appeared in Entrepreneur, Lit Hub, Catapult, The Rampus, Medium, and so many other places I could mention. You live in Brook, Brooklyn. I called, uh, I said the Bronx earlier, but it's not the Bronx. <laughs> You're away from the Bronx. Um, you've written this, this book that I've done a lot of research on recently called Black Buck. Now, for those of you that, that need to know what this book is about, I'll, I'll give you a little insight into it. It tells a story of the rise and fall for a young black salesman at an all white tech startup. Uh, let that sink in for a moment, just to tell you like <laughs> what this book is gonna, is gonna be hard hitting, but it's a story of how one man battles racism and microaggressions, which is very interesting, to get to the top of a cult-like startup. Damn, <laughs> when, it come, when it becomes clear he's a token black guy, he hatches a plan to help people of color infiltrate America's sales teams setting off a chain of events that forever changes the game. It's a razor sharp novel that skewers America's workforce, explores ambition and race and makes way for a necessary new vision for the American dream. And it's been endorsed by some pretty, pretty high hitting names, man. You've got uh, on, on the back here, you've got Jay Ellis, who is an actor, who's a very well-known actor. Um, mm -hmm. And you've got Colson Whitehead on the very front, who's the author of Nickelback Boys and um, the, the Underground Railroad. So, Matteo, welcome so much to the Storybox podcast. Jay, thank you for having me, brother. I'm happy to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here, man. Oh, that was probably a long introduction, but I thought I'd do it anyway. <laughs> you deserve it. You did it big. You did it big. So, uh, I appreciate it. I'm grateful. Go big or go home, right? That's the saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> dude, before we dive into your, your, your backstory, why you do what you do in the first place, I usually start off all my interviews with one particular question, and that is, what does success look like to you? I'm so happy you asked it, Jay, because with this book and with the one of the aims of my life, it's to empower other people, as you read in the end, um, and it's to empower other people to succeed, but success doesn't look the same to all of us right? For some of us, it's a six figure salary. For others, it's being able to go home to a family that is safe and healthy, especially during these times and have a home cooked meal, right? Or just having a home in general. Um, other people, it's make dollars, <laughs> you know? So success is, is relative. And I'm so happy that you kicked this off in that way. For me at this point in my life, success, at least related to this book, is having people send me a message and say, I couldn't put your book down. I didn't want it to end. But most importantly, Jay, now just not stroking my ego, they say, I saw myself reflected in your book. Or I've learned something from your book that will allow me to be a better person, ally, and more informed on what's going on in this moment, as well as being more understanding of the fact that this moment is just connected to a series of moments throughout history that have come before and will come after. So that success means to me at this point in my life, um, there's just, there, there's so many definitions of it as well. You know, being able to write something that feels true to me, whether an essay, um, being able to have a great interview where I felt as though I spoke my truth. I was my, my authentic self while also um, being fun and positive and engaging and not just being one thing at any point in time, being a good son, a good brother. All of these things are definitions of success to me, Jay. And if you were a question years ago, you likely would have gotten a, a different answer. I can imagine. It, it sounds like you've gone through a, quite the journey to get to this point. I'm curious, how does it make you feel when you get those kinds of messages from people that have read your book, that couldn't put it down and they actually get something from it? It's hard because it's, it's still new, but the first is that I feel as though I did something right. That 
I achieved one of my aims people feel seen, to help people feel less alone, to help people people feel empowered, to help people also engage with some of these heavier topics, um, but be able to find the absurdity and hilarity in them still, right? Because I didn't want to write 400 pages of tragedy and trauma or doom and gloom. I do depict a reality that many of us experience in this world inside and outside of the workplace, but there have been far better people and far better people in the future who write about um, these very serious topics um, with a very serious tone. But for me, in the way that my mind works, right, it, it's humorous, it, it's fun, but then it's also serious. And sometimes it's from second to second, right, or in the book, page to page, chapter to chapter, part to part. So seeing these messages, I'm like, yes, I did something right. This is resonating in the way that I wanted to. But also, Jay, when I see a message and knock on wood, fortunately, there's not many of them that are like, ah, oh, I couldn't finish this book or ah, oh, like I really hated the character and I, and I didn't like what happened in the rest of it. I still feel, and I say this sincerely, I still feel as though it's a win because at least they felt something. For me, again, just speaking about the book, Failure would be defined as someone reading the entire book, putting it down and saying, whatever, mm. that didn't, that I didn't feel anything. I didn't spark any thought. I'm not going to think about the book at least for a day or a week or however long after, because it didn't linger um, in my, in my mind or my spirit or my heart. Um, so yeah, it feels good to get those messages, man. I got a message. This is just an aside, but I got a message on Instagram and um, a person wrote, your book helped me through post-op brain surgery. I said, what? Yeah, when I was speechless, I was looking at my phone where we're paralyzed, my, my thumbs, you know? I was like, what? She, she said um, it was the, the will to forge ahead, the Bible and your book that helped. And I was like, yo, what? What? Black buck putting it next to the good book and, and whatever, you know, intrinsic motivation you have. That's huge. And I just, I thanked her for giving me that gift of knowing that the book could help her in that way. There have also been other people that want to throw the book across the room that were lighted on fire. So, you know, uh, it varies. <laughs> you get a bit of both worlds, don't you? And I think that's like yeah. with anything, man, it could be, you know, just with podcasting, but you're putting yourself out there. You're putting a version of you, your truth in writing form, which is very vulnerable. And mm -hmm. I know myself having like written my own book, which it took me two years to actually finish the damn thing. It was, it wasn't because like it was tricky to write. It was the actual truth and the message that I was writing, which became the hardest part to relive and put into mm. word form. So that's, that's what I found is, is rather tricky. Um, so for you, man, I'm curious, what is your truth? Where did you find your truth? Like what were some of the values that you grew up with? Yeah, the values I grew up with, I mean, comes from my mother, she's from Jamaica and my father's from Iran. Um, and that's the, that's the type of mixed household that I grew up in, even though it was far more, um, Afro-Caribbean and black than it was Middle Eastern by any stretch of the imagination, because my father didn't really tell us anything about his life or his country. He was just like, you all can be raised as black men in America and will go on vacations to Jamaica to see your mother's family. My Jamaican grandmother, who was an English teacher in Jamaica, also raised us in the, in the home. Um, so there was a strong immigrant work ethic, of course, though, mm -hmm. from my father as well. Waking up early, going to work, not complaining about it, even if you don't like it, doesn't matter because um, my parents from a generation and and maybe yours too, Jay, of you're just, you got to work to make money and you don't have to enjoy it. You need to put food on the table. And that's what's most important. Whereas today, and I'm one of these people, and I, I think you are too, who try to encourage other people to live into their dreams and to live their best lives and chase success, however they define it. But the truth of the matter is not everyone can because not everyone is in the same place. Right. I can pay for my rent. There are some people worrying about paying for their rent, so they can't dream. Um, but a strong work ethic was instilled in me from a young age. Um, 
being able to embrace the different parts of yourself was also instilled in me, even though I, I ignored it at times, many times throughout my life. And um, that comes into play in terms of the, the formation of Black Book, the novel. Um, having some levity about yourself. My parents are funny people, right? They're, they're not constantly telling jokes, but they like to laugh. They like to make other people laugh. Um, and, they, and they're kind people who try to help people um, as often as possible. So those were some of the values that were instilled in me. But again, to keep it real, I didn't hold on to those values throughout my entire life. Many times I pushed away from them. And especially when I got into the world of startups and sales, I was hungry as hell, man. I was like 21 when I first began working at this startup. I wanted to do anything to get hired to be one of these people. I remember seeing... Um, colleagues. And this was the, this was when the startup only had 20 people. They would go and they'd buy a salad or they'd buy lunch. And I dreamed of the day when I could buy lunch. Um, I would get like a dollar slice of pizza, but I was like, damn, I want to be able to spend $12 on a salad, even though that's ridiculous. I was like, I want to be able to do it. Um, and it eventually happened, but I, I, I lost myself along the way. And I'm sure that we'll get into that a little bit, but in terms of the book, speaking my truth was not exactly writing about myself one-to-one. -one. I think that would have been foolhardy. I wouldn't have been able to gain the distance that was needed to write the book in a way that is touching people so deeply. It was just blow by blow about my own life and the history, but more so to write about things that I've experienced inside and outside of the workplace, whether it be a microaggression or overt and bizarre racism, um, what it means to really internalize a mission that's handed down to you. And, and by mission, I mean the company, right? A company mission and all that goes into it and the fine line between cult and culture. Um, what it means to get lost and to lose yourself and the, the cost that so many of us pay to succeed mm. in the workplace and to get ahead. So those were some of my truths that, that, um, that pervade the pages of the novel. Mm. Wow. I want to give people a bit of context here. So Going back a bit, because there's a lot to sort of unbox there, going yeah. back a bit to, I guess, how you grew up and what you saw yourself being. I, I don't think from that response, you saw yourself being a writer to start off with, or did you? And why sales as well? Yeah, great question. Um, when, I, when I was a, a kid, I always thought I would write a book, but I thought that it would be like many of the people that you've spoken to, someone who became successful from starting their own business and success, however they defined it. And then I'd write a book when I was like 40, 50, or 60, explaining how I did it. We see all these books, right? We don't see them from a lot of like black men, but we see these books all the time. So that's the type of book that I thought I was gonna write, even though I've always loved fiction. Um, but when I was a kid, <laughs> I actually never mentioned this in, in an interview, I wanted to be president, but I was afraid of being the first black president because I thought that I'd get shot. <laughs> or assassinated. And then we see, you know, knock on wood, Obama made it through. So, you know, he, he did it. Um, but that's, that's what I wanted to be. And then as I got older, I became somewhat of a rebel. And then I said, why don't I transform this, uh, this rebellion that I have into something that could be used for good and enter politics? So I said, okay, I'm going to go to college, which I did, uh, study something law related or, or law adjacent. I studied politics. That's what we'd called it at my, my specific university, not political science as many others do, but we called it politics. And then I was going to go to law school and become a politician. By the end of my time at, at uni, as I think you'd all call it, <laughs> that's not what we call it over here, but at the end college. of my time, yeah. college, college, there you go. I was thinking uh, the UK. Um, I was like, nah, man, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to go and like clock my hour by the sixth of a minute to make all this money to just pay back the hundreds of thousands from law school that I've amassed. Um, I, I wasn't feeling it. Um, so I went to some government program. It sounds so weird and like vague when I say that, but it was like a, it's like a prestigious scholarship called the critical language scholarship in the States at the U S state department, um, sponsors for Americans to learn languages that typically we don't, we don't study, right? So it's not your Spanish, French, or Italian. It's your Azerbaijani, your Russian, your Mandarin, or in my case, um, your Persian. Because like I said, my dad, he's from Iran where they speak it predominantly, but he didn't teach me it. So I got into this program and they flew us to Tajikistan. 
which is the poorest former Soviet Union state in Central Asia, uh, for those who don't know. And we went over there and it was an incredible experience. I came back very proficient, but I was like, I'm not working for the government. And I'm not doing anything related to this. I just wanted to like learn my dad's language and have a good time. So I came back and I was at my parents' house and I was just applying for job after job after job, like 30 jobs a day, literally through my university's um, career portal. And I was having interviews for like an executive assistant, for a paralegal, to run a gym, like a lot of random stuff. And then I found this, this startup that was teaching people how to use the internet. Uh, I went through two interviews and funnily enough, it was to write content for their video content because they, they created these 60 to 90 second videos um, called micro learning that was going to teach people how to use the internet, different websites. And I came back from my second or third interview and they said, listen, man, we just gave, we just gave the job away, but we want you to intern here. And once I was like intern, someone immediately flew into the room and was like, sort of reverse closed me and was like, calm down. Like you got it. You got the interview. And I was like, God, what? And uh, I made a commitment to go in two days a week. I had to wake up at 4 a.m. And I originally was from Long Island. So my mother, she works in Manhattan. She'd drive in. And then I would drive into Manhattan for her own job. And then I would sleep at a friend's place. And then I would go to work at the startup for free. They wouldn't even give me um, a Metro card uh, for the subway. And it was there that I really cut my teeth there where I was so hungry and I wanted to get on and there that I had the do or die mentality. <clears throat> and I was taught that you will make it here if you're willing to run through a brick wall. Uh, that if you will work as hard as possible, that you will become one of us. And listen, Jay, <clears throat> it worked out spectacularly, right? I came in when I was 21, um, eight or nine months later, <clears throat> excuse me, eight or nine months later, now I'm 22 and I started the sales team with the CEO. So it was something that was somewhat pressed upon me. That was like, listen, I think you want to do this. I think you'd be very good at this, especially because an investor had vouched for me who I met at like a happy hour. And he told the CEO, you have to start the sales team with this young guy, Mateo. He's positive. He's articulate. He got a motor. Mm -hmm. So I got roped into it. And like, Two years after that, two years after that, the, the company went from about 20 to like 230 people. This sales team went from just me to like 90 people. I was 24, managing 30 of them, mostly the cold callers and people calling inbound leads. I know you're no stranger to that. Um, and I was making over 100K. And I was 24. It was, it was wild, man. So that's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> Mate, that is insane. So did you ever think that you were like having started at this like company as an intern, did you ever think that you were going to become like, I guess, the leader of, of this sales team at all? No, I, I had no idea about getting into sales at that point when I was an intern. I was just so focused and with, with, a, with a single minded ambition that was relentless to just be a part of their team. Mm. And when I, when I was an intern, I was officially hired um, in the company a couple months after that to run their social media and their community management. And I loved doing that. I loved being able to interact with the community and build it. But then, as I said, there came the time that we need to start making money, as any startup should or would. Um, and they identified certain talents that I had. And while I didn't, unlike my, my protagonist, Darren in the book, who then becomes Buck, same person, different name. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't take off in sales when I first got in. I wasn't, I wasn't this aficionado or, or this prodigy, even though I was young, I had many marbles in my mouth. Um, I had the nerves, but then something clicked and it clicked and it worked out. But I did know Jay, when I was an intern, that I was going to do whatever I had to earn my spot there with the idea that not that I'd run a sales team or excuse me, a portion of the sales team, but that I would eventually start my own company. Mm. That was the bigger picture that I had in mind. And that's something that for people who read the book, I, I comment on the difference between inspiration and motivation because they're different things. Yeah. Motivation will get you jacked up. Yeah. I'm going to go work really hard for like an hour or two, or maybe a day. Inspiration taps into your purpose and the core of your being and will allow you to work harder and with more purpose and intention for far longer to achieve your goals. Mm. 
I say the Sorry, I keep turning to the side, man, because I'm like looking into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good, man. Like I, I say the exact same thing. Like there's a difference, and I love how you you related the difference between motivation and inspiration. I think that's a very good uh, point to raise there for some people because all of us are seeking some kind of motivation. You know, we we want to propel forward. I think inspiration goes deeper than that. It's mm. so much, so much deeper. And I think you're spot on. It goes deep to our purpose. And I've always said that our purpose is not what we do. That's mm. got nothing to do with it. Our purpose is who we are inside. It's our character. It's our values. It's our beliefs. That is our purpose 100 yes. percent through and through so when you talk about okay what do i really want out of life i realized going through my journey at the age of i'm just 24 now but i was 23 when i realized this you're 24 whoa 24, man <laughs> rocking this podcast <laughs> much respect brother Mate, much respect. yeah 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 um, you're stroking my ego there <laughs> <laughs> but um i appreciate that but Really what I realized was what I want the most out of life is to help people more than me, more than anything else in the world. I know my true purpose that won't really change. It will evolve with how I do things, but going back to who I am is helping people. And then I allow my purpose to serve everything else that I do. And then that makes me happy. It's like this inspirational flow on effect. Like I just have it within me, you know, and I've had, mm. I don't know if you've had this Mateo, but people come up to you and they say, what you are doing, your actions are inspiring. I said, no, 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 no. Who I am mm. is inspiring. That should inspire you. Not mm -hmm. what I do. That is, that is the result mm -hmm. of me like who I am, <laughs> if that made any sense at all. It's a byproduct. It makes perfect sense. 100%, man. So I think what you wrote about Black Buck, I think it's an important message for people to actually adhere to and, and understand that. And, and what I'm curious about is going back to, to your story a little bit and bringing it, bringing it forward is what ended up happening to you and, and to your, your job? Like, where did you go? Yeah, Jay, if, if I may touch on a few things that you just brought up, for me, what allowed me to write this book is because I had finally, finally, finally realized that service is the highest purpose. Oh, yes. And this book... I wanted to write it to impress myself first and foremost. I wanted it to be something that I was proud of and that I would want to read and that would keep me engaged over the course of 386 to 400 pages. But priority number two was to serve people and to especially serve people who have either been the only one in an environment or one of the few. And this doesn't just have to do with race, even though I was primarily thinking of black people when I first wrote it. Right. But I want I want all people to be able to read it and, and find things in it that help them. But it also extends to people who have been the only one due to their religion, sexual orientation, gender expression and the like. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to write this book, though, if it was just for me. I had to think of the people that I that I wanted to serve because I had to come to this page, blank pages, sometimes half full pages, full pages every day with a certain amount of energy to get this done. Um, but in terms of that question that you brought up about why am I here, bring it to the book. That's what changes my character, uh, Darren's life. He is, for the first time, someone asks him, what are you doing here? And not why are you working at Starbucks? Because in the beginning of the book, he's working at Starbucks in Midtown Manhattan. And that's where he encounters this startup CEO named Rhett, who Darren eventually sells a different drink. And that's what kicks off this whole journey. But after Darren sells him the drink and then Rhett yanks him out of Starbucks the next day to have a conversation with him, Rhett says, why are you here? Why do you exist? 
And for the first time, this young man, Darren, who so many people says has potential, has to ask himself that question, why am I here? And it's when you're forced to ask that question that sometimes you get answers you like, and sometimes you get answers that you don't like. But what it's gonna, what it's gonna cause is thought and thoughts that you just can't get rid of easily. So answering your question directly now that you asked about what happened to me, um, I rose up at that company, right? Let's pick it up from when I was 24, your age, making that money, managing at least 30 people. I used to have to lead a stretch actually every day too, a stretch with like 90 salespeople. Can you imagine having to wrangle 90 salespeople who are intelligent, who are aggressive, who are fearless in many ways? Every day in a circle, I'd have to lead them through a series of stretches and then at the end dispense some spiritual information to get them like ready and not religious, but just like close your eyes, envision what you want today, envision closing that deal, things like that. I had to do it almost every day for at least two years. And I had to, I had to come up with something new <laughs> almost every day, right? Uh, my, my whole self was in this company and there were parts, there were, there were large parts of myself that I, that I lost. And um, there were things that I had to work through when I left the company, but there were also many pros, right? I, I can't discount that. I'm not coming here on this podcast saying, I hate sales, I hate startups, I hate business, I hate entrepreneurship. I don't, I don't. And I think it surprises some people, especially now that I'm this author with this novel, New York Times bestseller, right? But I also understand the darker sides to those aspects. And I'm not afraid of discussing those either. But I do try to present this authentic, balanced reality. Um, so what happened was it was around 2016 and I became disillusioned with the world of sales and the startup I was working at. I felt as though I actually wasn't really changing the world and I, I could no longer bring myself to like interview people and persuade them, especially if they were talented to join the company. Um, I felt as though I was just going through the motions and what I abhor, um, more than moving in the wrong direction, it's just going through the motions every day and being stagnant. It, it was almost synonymous to death in my mind. So I eventually mustered up enough courage and I left the company. I quit in 2016 in August specifically. Um, and I, I, at that point, I had already been writing. It was May 21st, 2016 that I began writing a, a novel not really knowing what I was doing, just knowing that it felt right. I would no longer party with the team. I'd go home on Fridays, I would sleep. And then on Saturday, um, again, instead of partying more, I would write. And then Sunday, instead of partying more, I'd maybe write more or just like reflect. Um, and when I quit my job, I had finished that first novel. I'd written two before this one with Black Buck worked out. I had finished that first novel and I got a one-way ticket to Costa Rica. And I was hitting up the heads of the best literary agencies, not knowing what I was doing and nothing uh, worked out, you know, with that first book, even though I did have nine agents who looked at it, I, I at least had the pitch, right. And I thought that I was going to be on, I was like, man, I'm got to move from this sales guy to this author. Oh, I'm going to show everyone, look at how I could pivot so seamlessly. That didn't happen. There was a necessary humbling Jay where the first book didn't go anywhere. The second book, which uh, I, I wrote while traveling again, didn't go anywhere. And it was at that time when I hit creative rock bottom that I had a conversation with myself. And I said, you are going to commit. You are going to commit to achieving your goals of sure, getting an agent, getting a book deal, but more so now you have a new goal and it's to write something true for yourself, for the people you want to serve and the nation that you live in and, broad, and more broadly the world. So I told myself, this is now November, 2018, that whether it took me six months or six years, I was going to do this. There was no turning back. And that is the energy that I took into this when I began writing this specific book in January, 2018. And I'm just so happy that it worked out, Jay, because there is a reality where I'm working on book number seven and I'm not speaking with you right now. Wow. <laughs> that is an <laughs> insane story, man. And one that I can actually really relate to, especially the why you hear question. I had a similar experience uh, in 2019 because I was in real estate. I was in sales. I was in the whole oh, way. Wow. I was actually very, very good at it. Uh, mm -hmm. Not at the start, <laughs> but yeah. sort of as, as we progressed. 
And um, things didn't really work out for me there. There's a whole story to that as well. But I was actually, I applied for one particular job, which was a recruitment position. Mm. And out of 180 applicants down to a group of six, they did a group interview. I was chosen uh, to, you know, like progress later on. But they had this CEO that came there of the entire company. And we had to do like a 10 minute quick interview with him. And Mm. I sat down with him and he asked me this one question at the very start. He's like, why do you want to be here? Why do you want to work here? And I looked at him and I said, I want to help people. Not really realizing what that actually, the full extent of what that meant. And as I'm going home on the train, I start doing the reflection. I start thinking, why did I say that? Did I I just say that I want to help people get a job or get a house or sure I could do that. But it's got to be something more to life. There's got to be something more to me, to my purpose and who I am. And that's when I realized, no, I've got a story. My story is X, Y, and Z. I've been through so much in my young life. Mm. What if I was to share that? How many other people are out there that have a story that isn't being told? Mm. What if I was to quite unbox that and let the world see it? and hear it and hopefully that might help inspire people to realize that they are worth something that they are meaningful doesn't matter the color of your skin your race where you come from doesn't Mm -hmm. matter we're all we all can be we're all human beings at the end of the day we all can be inspired to become better to improve our life some way or another we all have a purpose and you 100 percent. and i'm i was the same I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can to build whatever it is I need to build to make people realize that. And so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd share that with you, but I think it's amazing how you got to wow. where you were to where you are right now. And I didn't even know you are a New York Times bestselling author. Congratulations. Oh, Rick. yeah, man. Yeah, I don't really lead with it, but it happened. Thank you. Congratulations. That is a huge milestone, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's crazy, fun. right? Now it's sort of like even crazier to hear this whole story and then know that like it's obviously not the end and this is just the beginning, but that it resulted from intern to then. This is New York Times bestseller, man. You can't make it up. Mate, you're famous. <laughs> that is that is insane. Like that's the epitome of, I guess, authorship when you made the New York Times bestseller list. So the one definition of it, yeah, it's not the end all be all, but it is nice, and it, and it is something again. Being honest, that I did want. Yeah, I, I have um, I have a goal of mine, which is to actually become a New York Times bestseller, not for the fame, not for the recognition, but where that book or that story can go. And I think that's yes. that's the important thing for this book in particular that I'm mm-hmm. holding up and where this is going. And how we were able to connect is absolutely an amazing story, but um, <laughs> I'm glad that we did. I'm curious, man, like moving moving a bit to to our conversation because I do want to be respectful of your time. That you right. you spoke about this microaggression that I'm mm-hmm. fascinated by. For those people that don't know what microaggression is, what is it? How does it fester in, I guess, someone's life or a business? And how can we remove it in society? Oh, that's a big question. And the last, the last one. Um, <laughs> microaggressions are seemingly innocuous um, or mundane slights rooted in racism, right? So it's not someone calling someone else a derogatory term, but it might be them assuming that they come from a certain place because they look a certain way, for example, right? Like if someone were to see me and say, hey, like, do you rap, right? Just looking at me, even though I do like to rap, to be honest, and I do like to freestyle, <laughs> right? But that, that, that would be a form of a microaggression. Or in the book, it manifests in a few different ways. One is when Darren, again, the sole black employee, starts working at this company, everyone's calling him brother. Mm-hmm. Hey, brother. 
what's up, brother? What's up, my brother? You know, that's a form of a microaggression where it's like, it's a little funny, right? But at the same time, um, it's rooted in a sense of ignorance, right? They need to talk to someone of a certain color in a certain way. Then there's something else. This is another funny example, but it happens so often in the book. I don't want to ruin it for you, but I'm going to say it. Do it. Do um, it. <laughs> So it first starts out and it's super funny. People are like, hey, did anyone ever say that you look like Martin Luther King? And then someone else is like, hey, did anyone ever say that you look like Malcolm X? And then someone's like, hey, did anyone ever say that you look like Drake? This is constantly happening throughout the book. It's, it is so funny and hilarious. But by the end, you're like, does this actually happen? And if it actually happens, where, what, what does the person feel who's experiencing this, right? Um, so that even this instance that we just had, that is what the experience of reading this book is like, where you're laughing and then a couple pages later, you're like, wait a second. <laughs> Holy shit, is this actually as funny as I thought it was? Or it, did this turn into something else? There, there's a constant illusion and, and blurred lines that I'm playing with um, that causes, or excuse me, asks um, a good amount of the reader to discern what is going on at any one point in time in this young man Darren's journey. Um, so that's, that's what a microaggression is. And in terms of how to root it out of the workplace or the world or our lives, I'm not the authority on it, but I believe that first it comes down to awareness. We need to be aware that these things exist. And then after awareness which starts in the mind, we have to believe that they exist in our heart, right? There's, there's one thing, for example, for someone to say, okay, okay, I know, I know racism is bad, right? Sure, I'm not a racist, racism is bad. But then for someone to actually believe it and to act in accordance with it, like you were talking about before, that when you have your purpose, it just suffuses itself throughout all of your actions and your behavior because it's who, it is who you are. Yeah. So in the same vein, I believe that if someone truly understands and truly believes that racism is bad, for example, it will affect who they are and how they act and how they move in the world. They will no longer be defensive and say, that's not me. I'm not one of those people. They will rather say, how have I possibly been complicit in what's going on? Or has this manifested in my life in a way that I didn't know? At least just doing some honest and unflinching self-examination. So I think that those are two ways um, to help improve things. But it is not one thing. It is a gradual and concerted effort taken upon by many people. Mm. I think you um, you said it perfectly there. Awareness is often taken for granted. There are a lot of naive people out there. I myself included in that for many. Me too, in many ways. Like it, it just happens. Like we can go under the radar with these kinds of big issues that do happen and do uh, spark up in in the workplace or just in in our lives with friends. Because I grew up with. Um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, Filipinos. So mm. I grew up with a, a great ethnic ethnic community around mm. me. I never judged them. I didn't really care what they look like or what race they're from. I thought it was it was cool. Yeah. Um, I didn't even fit in, like in my own school. Yeah. Like it was it was funny yeah. how that worked. But you know, we'd always say, "Hey, brother, how you doing, mate?" Like yeah. there was no stereotype. We didn't judge one another. We didn't hate on one another's race. No one, we just accepted and we just loved each other for who we were. Yeah. And there was that, yes. that, that camaraderie, that community, that brotherhood, which I think is oftentimes missing because you look at somebody on the exterior, you see their, their skin is a different shade to yours. Well, so what? Yeah. So what, mate? Like, yeah. get over it. Like, yeah. what, what makes them less of a human being than you? Like, yeah. what if you, I always say, put yourself in that person's shoes for a moment and maybe try and feel what they're feeling mm -hmm. and really get an understanding, get your head around that for a moment. Like if they're being constantly abused for the way they look, how is that right? Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's the way society has just sadly, it's getting a lot better, which I've mm -hmm. been seeing, but way back when, so I get passionate about this stuff too. No, no, no. I, I like it. And you're, you're, you're touching on something, Jay, that's important that um, it's not even, there's layers to this, right? It's not even always how you look. Sometimes it's how you speak. I'm sure in Australia or even in Sydney, there's neighborhoods where if you hear that someone's from there, 
there, there may be stereotypes associated with that neighborhood, right? right. Or that part of Australia. It's the same <laughs> thing, right? Where sometimes it's related to race. Sometimes it's related to um, how you grew up. If you went to the right schools, there's levels to it. Um, but what I think is very important to point out, and it, it, it's a belief of mine, is that we shouldn't be colorblind and we shouldn't be blind to where people come from. But as you said, accepting and celebrating people for who they are. That's super important because for some people, they have, and, and some people who are well-intentioned, let me be honest about it, they're well-intentioned. They say, well, you know, he's just the same as me or she's just the same as me or they're just the same as me. When in fact, they're not. And that's a good thing. And that's okay. And we're all valuable. We are all equally valuable as humans, 1000%. But we come from different places. We have different values. And the beauty is when UJ can go to school with Filipino people and have real camaraderie, brotherhood, and love between them. And they are accepting you and celebrating you as Jay, this individual, and you are celebrating who they are. That for me is beautiful and something to be desired. Mm. And I think it, it is a huge issue. Like you mentioned, I think there's, there are so many layers to it. I like how you brought up culture. I think. Mm. Lower class, middle class, upper class yep. was the worst system ever invented. And I think it's like, it's ridiculous. Like the rich think they're better than you because they got more money than you. Like you take that away. What are you? You just eat another human being. Like yeah. I think it was um, Jim Carrey that said this. He, he wishes that everyone could be rich to notice how it doesn't satisfy, how it doesn't mm. help. It's just like, sure, money's great, but look at what it's doing to people, to, to their minds. And I guess it also, also depends on who you are as a person. Yeah, going, yeah, back to that, going back to that authenticity aspect at the same time. But um, the Bible says, the good book says, the love of money is the root of all evil. There's a reason why it's there. <laughs> you just, you just look at like the, the way the love of money has, has yeah. translated into our society. It's, it's yeah. a shame. But um, there's a there's a lot of uh, Bible verses in my book actually, but they're not used in the way that you would think. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to read it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is gonna yeah. be a fun read. I'll definitely let you know what I what I think of the book Please. when I Please. do finish it. Um, yeah. Two more final questions for you, Mateo. Sure. If you don't mind. Okay, not this one this one may be a hard one to answer, but we'll see how we go. Uh, what has been the worst piece of advice you've ever received? You're right. It's hard because I've received so much bad advice, to be honest. <sighs> Wake up at 4.30 a.m. maybe. <laughs> you know, some, some of those lists are like, you know, you know, those lists for success. And it's funny because I wrote one for Barnes & Noble, um, a big book retailer over here. I don't know if they're in Australia. And I, I flipped the whole success, like tips for success list on its head a little bit, starting with tip number one. Um, never neglect your loved ones, you know, more, more substantial things, but yeah, I don't know. Never wake up at 4 30 AM. Excuse me. Wake up at 4 30 AM is one that I was always like, okay, you need to wake up really early in order to be successful and go to sleep at night very early that I understand where they're coming from, but it doesn't compute because some people work best at night in different ways. That's not me, but that's just the way that I look at it. Um, ah, yeah, it's just so hard. Let me think of, let me take a second. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. Mm. Or sometimes you need to dim parts of your own light in order to get ahead. That's another where people will say, you know, you don't always have to be your authentic self. Sometimes you can just fade into the background and remain silent um, in order to get that promotion or in order to, you know, reach whatever milestone is in your mind. That for me um, would probably be the worst piece of advice that I've received you know, more, more, 
uh, dangerous and then wake up at 4.30 a.m. or eat protein first thing in the morning or, or all those other things. Take a cold shower, run five miles immediately, right? Um, those pale in comparison into telling someone to dim their light and to not shine brightly. Because in the same way, Jay, that you said, we all have a purpose, which I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly believe, um, we all deserve to shine brightly. And that sounds real hallmark and corny now that I just said it, but I do believe it, right? Some of those hallmark cards are corny, but they're all truthful, right? At the end of the day. Um, and, and there's a reason why adages become so common that they can go on a hallmark card. They start from a kernel of truth. Um, yeah, so that would be uh, my answer. There's a reason why something is a cliche. It's, exactly. You've said it. It is true. So you've spoken your truth today, which I absolutely love. And I hope you felt like you were able to speak your truth. I Um, loved it. Yeah. Dude, my final question for you, this is my all time favorite question. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment, it's a hypothetical one, but just imagine with me that you have been able to reach the age of 100. Your friends have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me or imagine how in the world they got it all. We'll just call it magic. They've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? That I made a difference, even if for just a moment. That's what I wanted to say. You know, I've, I've come to the realization, Jay, that sometimes chasing this fake immortality of a legacy um, can be for nothing because you're constantly living in the future instead of affecting people now and today. And for me and the type of person I am, I'd love to leave behind a legacy, especially a legacy that could help many people. But what I want to do is make a difference now while I can see it and while I can feel it and while I can affect it. I love it, man. Where can people buy your book, learn more about you and connect with you, man? Well, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Ask Mateo, A-S-K-M-A-T-E-O. And then uh, you can go to buyblackbuck.com to see where you can purchase it. I'll make sure that is all in the show notes below when this episode drops. But Mateo, thank you so much for your life, man. Yeah your truths, your values, your authentic self, and for writing this book that we all needed. We didn't even know it. So thank you so much, man, for coming on the Storybox podcast. Jay, thank you for your time, man. I can't wait to eventually meet up in person.